Thirdly, language. Human language appears to be a unique phenomenon without significant analog in the animal world. Parrots may be able to mimic human sounds, but they aren't communicating their own thoughts and ideas about their own existence. If that were the case, you might hear them complaining about the food or debating the justice of cages for their fellow parrots. Funny. Anyway, while parrots might not communicate ideas about their own existence to us, they seem to communicate their thoughts in the sense that they are not just simply mimicking sounds, but using them as discrete, arbitrary, semantic units that convey information. In other words, very much like we do. Irene Pepperberg, in her 30-year study of an African grey parrot named Alex for Avian Language Experiment, found out that he could answer questions, convey desires, lie, differentiate himself from others, and was even learning phonemes when he died in 2007. True, the results, while some of them were already reproduced, are still controversial. For example, there is still the insistence of Dr. Herbert Terrace that this was merely a case of rote learning. These criticisms, however, at least for now, are slowly being refuted. Animals can respond to human voice commands, but these are simply adaptive traits that are conditioned through the reward of food for the performance of an act or response to a command. Well, Brooks, if you want to generalize it like that, my use of language is simply an adaptive trait conditioned through the rewards for my performance. How is this relevant? Of all the traits that a language has to have to be considered such, the lack of conditioning is not the one I've heard of. It doesn't matter what motivates me, you, or any other animal to communicate, what matters in this case is whether this communication in non-human animals is different enough for it to be considered unbreachable by unguided evolution. Celebrated linguist Noam Chomsky points out that humans have a language acquisition device, LAD, that animals lack. Yes, that's part of his theory of universal grammar, since it has never gained the backing of the scientific consensus and, in fact, was heavily criticized, I fail to see how this is relevant, however. Why, of all the fascinating theories about the origins of language, mention just this one? Especially in light of Chomsky's own view that language did, indeed, evolve naturally, it just happened very recently in our evolutionary history. If Proxy is trusting Chomsky enough to take his ideas as facts, even when they are not accepted by the scientific consensus, then why isn't he accepting his other ideas? Not only do we have the mental capacity for advanced thought, but we also have unique centers in the brain designed specifically for both language production and language processing. And what sensors would that be? And why are sensors responsible for production and processing? It'd be nice if there was a bit more details on something that important to the topic. Perhaps a source, even? Oh. Oh, it's still Noam Chomsky. Oh, okay. Moreover, our larynx is uniquely designed to create complex sound patterns required for advanced speech. This ability is not found in the animal world, only in humans. I seem to distinctly remember something being said about parrots just a few minutes ago. Oh yeah, that they are able to mimic human speech, and other sounds even. Or how about live birds? It's true that our closest extant relatives, the non-human great apes, do not have the structure of the larynx comparable to ours in terms of the possible complexity of sounds, but making a blanket statement that it is not found in the animal world is quite misleading. In any case, I hope you are beginning to sense the pattern in this list. Brooks scavenges science for the fields that are still young, developing, and have little research done in them, and then uses these as examples. Effectively, this means that he asserts that if we do not have a precise understanding of the issue at this very moment, it must mean that this understanding cannot be achieved in the future without abandoning the theory of evolution, and therefore his explanation should be accepted instead. What's worse is that it makes it very inconvenient for Brooks to mention the true state of affairs in the field, because it would show that scientists aren't really stumped to explain the origin of language. In fact, there are too many explanations right now, and the problem is figuring out which one is right. While the studies of animal communication are very careful to label it as exactly this, instead of animal language, it should be made clear that every aspect of what is used to define human languages is found in non-human animals. 
For example, a system with what constitutes a human language proposed by Charles F. Hockett in the 60s defines 16 traits that characterize human language and set it apart from animal communication. Some of these traits were rather ill-defined to begin with, such as the idea that every human language is necessarily using a vocal auditory channel, thus, for example, excluding sign languages for no good reason whatsoever. Some yet are pretty arbitrary, such as transitoriness, which is defined by the signals existing only for a brief period of time. What should be considered brief, and why can language only be transitory, when written languages and more obscure languages, such as not tile, exist, isn't entirely clear. Lastly, some seem to be only tangentially related to the language itself and more to the other capabilities of the speaker, such as reflexiveness, the ability to communicate about communication, and prevarication, the ability to use language to lie. However, even with this imperfect system, nearly every trait it describes can be found in various forms of non-human animals' communication methods, just not all of them simultaneously. For instance, Alex, the African grey parrot I mentioned earlier, nails nearly all of them, judging by the results collected by Erin Pepperberg, except reflexiveness and possibly productivity. Even though he was reported to combine two words into a new one to describe an object he didn't know the word for, it's not clear whether it was an actual occurrence of productivity and what else could he do. So, is there really an insurmountable amount of differences between human language and animal communication? I think not. Of course, the methods of communication used by non-human animals in the world exhibit a lot less of these diagnostic traits, but the experiments with non-human animals being taught languages show that they have the capacity to do so, or, at the very least, are very close to having this capacity. Though so the question moves from could humans gain the use of language in the process of unguided evolution to when and how did humans gain the use of language in the process of unguided evolution? And this question is precisely the one that the scientists are working on right now.